Hello, chess friends. This is International Master Valeria Lewolf, and welcome to today's lecture on YouTube. So, today we're going to be talking about a very interesting subject. We're going to be talking about learning, and we're going to be talking about a few different things, including typical situations and how to handle them, as well as how to study better. You know, and that I think is most interesting because I haven't had a lecture yet where I really talk about studying, where I talk about, you know, basically how to learn different things. Now, let's begin our lecture today by talking re about the, the, one of the one of the greatest, in my opinion, and interesting chess players the reigning world chess champion Magnus Carlsen. Now, Carlsen is a fantastic player, but a lot of people don't understand the way he's playing. What I mean is that there is a fantastic precision, but then some other people find his games rather boring. They look at them and then they say, Valeri, I can't get my head around what he's trying to do. It's just, I find that there is no sacrifice, there's no creativity, so how he's able to win those games, and I want to be able to, like, understand. So today I'm going to try and give you a little insight on the Grandmaster technique and what you can do to develop it as well as how to study and prepare to achieve such brilliant results. We're going to start with a fantastic game played by Carlson. I've shown a game against Fiddler and others by him in previous YouTube lectures but today I would like to share with you one awesome game that he played that illustrates exactly where or what he's really good at. So let me bring it up. This game was played between Carlsen and Boris Gelfand in the World Championship candidates in 2013. This is the candidates tournament, I believe, where Carlsen actually won and he went to qualify for a World Championship match versus a NAND that he also won and became a World Champion. But this particular game is very special to me. And I want to show you why. So, we copy first the notation. So there it is. Carlson was white. Grandmaster Guildfilm was playing black. And uh, don't worry, it's not a very complicated game. And I'm not going to be annotating the game. <laughs> no, forget about that. We're going to be talking about the thought process, the ideas, what you can learn. And more importantly, how you can actually borrow a little bit of that magic he's using on the board. So e4, c5, knight of three, knight c6. I wouldn't like to comment so much on the opening, except that it's interesting that so many chess players focus huge time on the opening. And I don't honestly get that. You know, opening, except if you haven't really prepared some trap, are really not so much about, well, winning. Openings are just about you getting a good position in which you can develop your pieces and you can make sure that you're you know you have a good control that's all that white wanted so as soon as this move is played as soon as the move of bishop b5 was played out okay then let's see now what did black what did white do e6 well there's a very important question and because I want to make this lecture most interactive, I'm going to ask you that question right now. Are we supposed to exchange on c6 and double the black pawns, but give away the bishop pair, or we are not? And now we talk about one of the most valuable questions in chess, evaluating imbalances. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. What would you say? Would you rather like to go forward, or maybe you would rather like to castle? What to do now? So, now, that's a kind of interesting question. No exchange castles. I think that's a nice idea. Castling is a good thing in the position because instead of exchanging, white carries on the development. Number one, before you exchange or before you engage into any tactics like that is to think about what stage you're in. White just wasn't in the middle game. So exchanging off 
doesn't necessarily bring him an advantage. Another problem of a possible exchange is that after the trade, then in case of Ddix to the C or even Bdix to the C, I think Black is going to get a good chance of preparing e5. And even though the bishops aren't too strong, White will have a hard time in opening the position. I guess White just didn't want to commit. Remember, the sole purpose of the opening is to make sure you can develop your pieces well, fast, and actually make sure they get out. This is especially important for people who feel like everything is about development and just making sure things are perfect. Like, um, I want to use this opportunity to tell you that the rules of opening are rules. They're not just suggestions. See, you may not necessarily see the lasting effect of it, but it's important that you get to follow them. You know, that's very, very valuable. In that regard, I want to recommend you to check the link below the video. Out there, there is about 250 hours of chess training by top grandmasters, which explain especially how the rules work in a game and what you have to do to improve them, your understanding about this. It's not just the opening, middle game, positional sacrifices, like defense attacking. It's an incredible, an incredible deal that you're actually going to get. It's 60% it's off a 250 grandmaster hours of training. It's, it's only valid for about 10 hours, something like that, during the webinar and a little after. So I recommend you to check it out because it's very, very special deal. In any case, going back to the game and what White was trying, after rookie one, Black played a6, White played bishop f1. He didn't want to give up the bishop. He just wanted to have it uh, preserved for later on. There, exchange. Knight takes d5. So let's see what, what any of you will do in this position. Keep in mind, we'd like to keep it simple. We'd like to have it, have it good. So what to do next? White's doing well, has good control, and the pieces are solid. So what to do next? c3, then d4. Not bad. But that would lose time. C4 also may be good, yet black would just come back, and then we wouldn't be able to play D4. Remember, you need the pawns in the middle to advance, not the pieces around the middle to advance. This move was very special for white, as the moment he played it, <clears throat> he knew that the center is going to open, the knight is going to come out, and most of the pieces that need to be out will also develop pretty strongly. This was good. It was really, really good. D4. Black played knight of six at this point, and then white developed with bishop to e3. Black plays c to the d4, and knight takes d4. Actually, some people would call that boring. Really, this is the build-up. So, see, it takes time to actually get this development out there. It takes time to get this uh, to get the, to get everything going, but uh, it, it's it was just really good. Now there is this chance to move to move out with the knight that we can have the support it. We can have that queen and the even the rook to come out. It was great for white the way he did it. And it's beautiful. Step by step we're turning this into something excellent. Alrighty. Knight takes d4. See Carlson does not believe, in my opinion, in opening so much. He believes in getting a decent position by simply following the right principles. It saves you a lot of time, a lot of time, tons and tons of hours of studying opening lines that you don't need to know, and yet it doesn't bring any effect. So this is what you have to do in this type of position. And uh, uh, like um, after continuing with the move of knight to d4, then we could see uh, this like the knight's going to come out, queen is going to come forward, and things are good. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's see. Knight takes D. In this case, Grandmaster Gelfan played Bishop D7. And Carlsen made a very special move. The very next move created the base for his position to improve and, you know, invade black at a much later stage in the middle game. It was one of these, I'd say, constructive moves that simply sets 
a good restriction and more space for our pawns and pieces. Let's see if anybody could give me a suggestion on how this will work. Think about that. White is doing good, but what we're looking for is a move that will help us more. Knight f5 is pretty. Thank you for suggesting. But then black is going to move out. Most likely he will, well, you can even challenge it with g. I, I, don't I don't think this is too perfect. There's another move that white picked up to do. c4. Really good. Very, very good suggestion. That pawn move takes out the d5 center square for black, as well as it opens the road for the queen. But more importantly, it helps white out with his ability to stamp, step up and stand strong. With moves like knight c3 and a few others like that coming out next, it's uh, rather easy to really get, the, get things well. And, uh, you know, it just feels good. After c4, the position is really pretty. And uh, let's see. <clears throat> After the move of pawn to the c4, black obviously had quite a bit to worry. And let's take a look and see what uh, happened. c4, knight takes d4, bishop takes d. Again, you may not necessarily feel why white is doing these moves and how they're really helping him. I mean, for the most part, it looks like a few weird moves is played out in the middle of nowhere. Why? Why would we, why would we bother? But then you can see these moves really count. They do. And white proves this really well. After the exchange in bishop c6, now white does knight c3, bishop e7, and he continues building. A lot of people try to explain the secret in Carlson's games and what really helps him. I saw a YouTube video, a very popular YouTube video, a lot of views in that. And that doesn't necessarily mean there was a high quality where, where a person, I think it was a master by the way, was explaining that the reason why Carlson is winning his games is because of the tension that he's keeping on his opponents. And that's not entirely true. Keeping tension depends on many things, whether your opponent can let you, and a lot of times he isn't actually doing that. But what he does is that he's able to gain those small advantages, like more space, better pieces, stronger coordination. And he really cares about setting up his game like a Lego constructor. You know, more or less, this is the simplest way to understand. Imagine you have a Lego constructor and you actually start, you know, setting, you know, building here, making this, making that, making that, you know, and, and knowing the important rules on how to make it better just helps you to make it really efficient. You know, if you try to build something quick, it's going to look ugly, but building it step by step by putting all the right elements just looks and works in the right way. And then when the action starts, you just have everything in place. So how can you fail? Well, Black felt that, and he played a5. That didn't actually interfere with White's plan as he continued simply setting up the pieces and building up more. Rook d1, queen c7, and uh, White even played the move of bishop b5, which just pushed the Black queen back. So let's see if anybody could recommend where do we go now. Now, by the way, I do encourage you to ask me any questions you may have about this game or anything with the topic of learning. So just any suggestions, put them on the chat. I would really like to answer and give you my, my feedback. So anyway, where is White supposed to go now? Take a second. Think carefully about it. It's an important position and a valuable question. What to do next? <clears throat> See, it's a, it's a really good sort of query because, you know, like with this, with this type of position, with the bishop and how everything looks, uh, it's a um, pretty solid defense of stability, but where do we go? I know you're thinking, so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about it and tell me your thoughts or suggestions. Mm -hmm. Queen g3, absolutely. You know, this is still the early middle game stage. Learning more about strategy requires you... <clears throat> To actually learn a little bit more about the different phases of the game.
The different stages of the game are, in my opinion, very important because when you think about them, <clears throat> when you really think about the different stages, you can get to understand that some of them are going to be different than others. This means you can't plan in the same way, let's say, in the beginning and in the, in the, on a later stage. It's, it's always different. So the thing that White wanted in this moment was just to take the opportunity and very, very beautifully built up so he can have his own pieces come down and look strong. It was a good thing. Queen g3. In the early stage of the middle game, you adjust. So even if you have good pieces in development, you make them better by simply regrouping or putting them against the opponent in better places. Does that sound boring? The way I'm actually speaking today in, in this month, Monotid, monotis, what was the word? I mean, I, I can't pronounce that. Monotonous voice probably is a bit boring to you. Uh, I mean, boring moves, boring Carlson game with boring explanations. Right. But you know that the best and most rewarding chess is actually the boring one? I mean, it's imagine like, a, like one of these... I actually like to bring the same similarity, like because I'm a great movie fan, now, there are two kinds of movies that I get to watch often. Like, there are kind of movies which are like blockbusters where there's a lot of action, special effects, very little substance, but it's like a lot of, um, you know, eye candy, so to speak. So it's very interesting, but there's very little substance. There's very little, you know, story. And then there's these others where there's very little action, but again, there's a lot of emotion. See, I personally prefer the second type. Because what you're able to do, you know, let's relate back to chess, is you get to see how the buildup, the tension, everything that you actually include in the position is, in the end, much more rewarding than the simple just eye candy, like, of, oh, a queen sacrifice, oh, let's attack him like this in one move. So you see my point. The whole idea is that the buildup is easier, more rewarding, and ultimately more powerful. So it gives you a long-term advantage and satisfaction as opposed to the quick jumps, let's attack him and try to break through. You can learn that by studying the games of the great masters like Karpov, Kramnik, Carlsen, and even the older ones which are easier to learn, like the games of Capablanca, for example, and Steinitz. They're really good games that bring a lot of value on how to build up works. Something you always notice is that these great masters love restriction. Sometimes that's done in purposeful moves by pawns, but on other cases, you actually do it through exchanges and challenging. In fact, black couldn't do rook takes d8 because of bishop c7, so you see one little disadvantage for black is that he had to do queen takes d8. Now we see the power of the queen and bishop connected. White gets the opportunity to control the file. It may not seem that significant, but believe me, it will. White makes another threat, pushing the black queen. And so far, I'd say that the position of white is pretty good. So how do we get to improve it even further? What to do now? Hmm. All righty. What to do now? Yeah, monotone, that's right. Sorry, I didn't know how to pronounce that word. Keep in mind, I've never I've never had a chance to talk talk about monotonies so many times. So yeah, rook d3. Okay. It's a it's a big move, rook d3. It, it's like after that we have the move of knight d5 come out, and then we have the chance to advance. Uh the, the queen is bad. Yes, of course. And we keep improving. Come on, Valeri, where am I going to attack? When am I going to do the real deal? Keep in mind, you cannot hurry. Rushing is for the people who look immediate attacks, and then they hope the opponent will blunder. But if you're playing at a beginner level, maybe that would work. But if you're playing at an intermediate or advanced level, this type of strategy wouldn't work. You have to take all the qualities and then attack. I call them features. If black takes the pawn on c4 now, we have the combination of bishop takes f, bishop takes f, and rook, sorry, that was a mouse slip, rook d8, check, takes, and then there we go. 
So that doesn't work. Uh, I think after rook to the d3, then he's got a problem. I mean, he can play queen takes to b2, but that, that also doesn't work because of the knight d5. So we got another threat. See, it's kind of interesting how quick the attacks can happen when you have the right buildup. So black didn't take any of those. He, he couldn't. So he just played queen to c2. What's the use of rook d3? Harassing the black queen. What if you just said it? The more important was just to keep the challenge and pressure versus black. So now what do we do? It's a good position. It's really nice to have it. I like, I like it a lot. But uh, what do we go about now? <clears throat> you know what? It's a pretty good position. Most of the white pieces feel excellent and they stand strong. Bishop to, uh, Rook F3. Good. good. Good good choice. I like that. But then black will just take it. Unfortunately, if, if the bishop wasn't there, it would, would be a great move. But not now. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, like, what do we do to improve the position at this point? A lot of the pieces that White has are good, but he doesn't have a whole lot. Can we do queen to g5? I suppose we could. But Black would have just challenged the queen and pushed it back. I, I don't I don't mind that, but I really don't think it would work too well. We need a different setup. We need a different candidate. Anyone? Why is the picture so blurry? It is so blurry because you have to change the resolution. There's a little button which basically suggests different resolutions. So you can actually click on 480 pixels. It's If you have it on 240, it will be blurry because it's just for less connection. So rookie three, not bad. But it just doesn't do anything. So... Plan to bring the bishop out? How do we bring it? It just doesn't look so good. It doesn't look so easy. You see, now we entered the so-called middle, like late middle game. The late middle of the game is when you've already finished up with the improvement, so to speak. You've kind of developed, you've improved. So you're starting the stage of the game in which you begin thinking about what you need to do to attack. Now, there are two ways, there are two aspects of how you can think about attacking. The first one is to actually look for ways to threaten or challenge the opponent. But sometimes you have to actually restrict him more. And, uh, you know, like uh, you can think about getting rid of the opponent's uh, active or, or, or improving or defensive pieces. All these queen f4 and moves like rig g3, they would work. But Carlson picked up on a much better move. He felt he felt like this bishop was serving all the defense and doing it really well for black. So letting it stay would just be, I guess, not enough. We can't quite do that much as long as black keeps that bishop around. So remember, you want to think about what's in your way. You want to think about what's just stay, standing there and being good. So White figured out a perfect candidate. He figured out the best to begin with would be pawn to b4. It was great. I mean, really, you just think about it. The pawn can now move alongside b5, and Black can take it because if he quite gets to take it, we'll get, get, we're going to get to capture the f6. So after b4, pawn takes b4, pawn takes b4, knight h5, and the actual move of uh, queen e5, we see the strength inside white's position here. Everything just looks so good and so strong at this point. You see, it's, it's impossible to see this whole thing from the start. It's impossible to do that. But with a little bit of effort, white, white managed to centralize his pieces, and he keeps growing his position quietly. Black cannot do too much about it. I mean, supposedly he's going to move his knight back to f6, but if he does, we get b5. He'll be pushed to go back to e8, most likely. 
and now white has knight d5 as an opportunity. So you see the tactics are going to happen. Don't worry about it. Positional improvement does not mean there will be no tactics. No. It means that the tactics will come at the right time and when the opponent is actually going to be weak. So this is pretty awesome. We have the tactic on f6. We have the threat on the e8. And this is beautiful. With the move of pawn to b4, white really destroyed, almost destroyed black's position. So black tried knight h5, queen e5, and then there was the move of bishop f6 that he attempted. It was a good move by black. It was really felt like that. Bishop f6, queen c7, and then uh, actually, or queen takes h5, which one of these should be made? Uh, in fact, in that particular case, Carlson just decided to exchange. Trading was nice. As black fought, the less pieces remain there, the more easy it's going to be for him. But keep in mind that there is a flaw. Exchanges indeed reduce the attack. However, they're also a problem for the defensive side as there will be less pieces to defend and oftentimes in an end game or eventually an end game, the fewer remaining pieces that dominate the fewer defensive ones is going to actually lead up to an even more terrible position than before. So what happens is that Black got into something similar. He exchanged too much, taking away the fewer remaining pieces, and now White is going to be dominating a lot more. Anyone have a, who has a suggestion on how White can do it? Think about it. Well, it's got strength, he's got power, and he's got good development. All the things we care about. But, as always, we need a little bit more to make this whole thing work. I want to hear some good suggestion. Rook h4 makes sense. I mean, I do get it. It's not bad. But what we can do is queen a5. It's restricting the black rook? No. It's just le uh, like leading up the initiative. White's queen finds a perfect spot. And now we're going to build from there. All that building, I know it's not for everyone. Some people just don't have the patience to do it. A anyone can do it. But not anyone has the patience to do it. And I like to make the difference. I like you to make a difference between these two. Being able to do it and having the patience to do it. Patience, one of the most powerful virtues in chess. Queen b6 is fantastic now. Look at the black rook being limited in the bishop. The worst problem the black has with his pieces is the fact that they're completely discoordinated. And thereby, even when he attempts an attack, there's very little that he can do. So why just keeps the pressure and continues moving forward? In fact, this game feels more like just white was moving forward and black was moving around. He never got anything good. Why did that happen? We're going to discuss that a little later when we come back to, to revise some of the key moments. But I want to show you how the things came. White just kept getting better. Queen on f6 adds more pressure from b6. And now follow the very important prophylactic move. If you want to learn how to play good chess, you got to learn about prophylaxis. There are many books and videos about it, but the, ba the ba very basic idea about prophylaxis is to keep an eye at anything that could be a weakness, realistically, and try to figure out a way to minimize that possibility. It's like a vaccine. I mean, a, a great one. <laughs> like, you basically do it because you don't want to get a virus. And once you do that, you're sure that you're not going to be actually getting a virus. So the same sort of thing in chess. We see a potential weakness we can realistically get. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, 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 a very, it's a very important thing to take the time and, uh, you know, just uh, make sure we can, we can defend. That's what we're, that's what we're looking for. Now, I want you to think about that. Now, you see, if you think about, okay, could my pawn on b5 get attacked? Let's protect it maybe by moving the rook or, you know, something like that. This is unrealistic. See? It's like if you get a vaccine versus, like, a medieval plague. This is never going to happen. So it's just a waste of time. In chess, we don't have that time.
So you only have to think about those important, you know, prophylactic moves in your position that will actually count. In that particular case, I'd say White will have a real problem if he moves the rook and eventually his king has no squares. We play at h4. This is the move that just sets everything in motion. The king can go very easily towards the h2 in case there is any danger. And uh, that's right. This is the sort of vaccine that we need for our position in case something goes wrong. It's a beautiful move. Very beautiful. And quite nice. So that's called prophylaxis. Taking an opportunity to do the defensive move or, the, the, you know, like the protective move before the danger happens. Don't wait until the danger comes so that you can defend because sometimes there will be no good defense. And also, after H4, I'm going to give you now a secret. So listen to me carefully. I've been teaching a lot of chess players, some of them beginners, others are intermediate players, and some are very advanced. I even teach it to an international master who actually has the same title as I do. In most times, when I see a game between an intermediate or a beginner player, I notice that the player who wins, wins that game, not so much because he outplays the opponent, but because the opponent makes a blunder. And a lot of times that's a mistake, or it's a horrible, horrible one even. So what that leads to as a conclusion is that oftentimes we don't win by outplaying our opponent, but simply by making less mistakes than he does. That is an essential idea to understand how you can outplay your opponents. Because I know that a lot of people are trying to play perfect chess. I'll tell you, don't try to play perfect chess. Make sure you play good chess. Make sure you choose the good moves, not the very best, but the, 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 the best the best looking good moves that you feel will improve without engaging any risks, without necessarily engaging any huge sacrifices. When you do that, you can get two things. First of all, you're going to get time to figure out when to break through and how to do it more precisely. And two, you're going to let your opponent the opportunity to mess it up. And he will, trust me. Such kind of approach like h4 lets the opponent to feel confused about what to do. Let him an opportunity to mess it up. And instead of finding a good, precise move, he'll often make a mistake out of frustration or just hurrying to do something first. So basically speaking, try to make sure you don't force the position, take the right prophylactic or improving moves, and let your opponent start trying first. When you do, you see how many mistakes you'll make. So basically, he'll serve it on a plate for you to just take advantage. That's what White does in this case. And there are too many moves, yet most of them are not good. White's intending rook d7, so Black made the mistake of bishop f5. So now White has rook d5 come in. In fact, Carlson wins this game with ease just by taking advantage of the opponent's small mistakes. Simple ways, simple mistakes, and a simple win. Very easy. Now the pawn falls, and actually, black gets some sort of initiative in this case. Now, uh, okay, let's talk about is your advice on h6 instead of g6. Let me get back, 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 back. Uh, h6 instead of g6. What would have happened in case black tried it? It's a good question. Thank you. Probably white would have just played b5 in the, in the same way. And I think black made a mistake, that's for sure. But I don't, I'm not sure if that would have been so much different, you know. White could still do a little h3, a little h3 as a prophylactic move. And uh, even, for example, if black plays rook a8, I feel like white can do queen c7. So it's a pretty good position. We can have c5 come down. We're going to have the queen. We're going to have the rook. And then we can have black just stay back and feel, feel the tension. Would that mean change too much? Probably no. Probably not. It would still be weak. But uh, yeah. Now, I want to talk to you about a part of the game that you can hardly learn from books. What to do when you get under pressure. Now, I do want to encourage you to check the link below this video. I'm going to copy it on the chat as well. It's with more than 250 hours of training, which explains a lot of these situations and the concepts that I'm bringing to you right now. Check it out because it's a grandmaster instruction 
as uh, you know, as opposed to any master, even me, I'm not a grandmaster, and it's fantastic because you're getting it for an incredible price. It's it's uh, uh, like sixty percent off, and it's it becomes you know an amazing an amazing price, like a, less than a dollar, I think, for per hour. It's it it be you know it becomes beautiful uh, to to just have the scores and study it and learn the concepts from it. Nevertheless. Talking about a situation when you get under pressure is where books can help you, or at least very few books cover that. And yet we have to know, them. because come you take advantage, you got to defend. Oftentimes you take over the initiative. So first of all, let me talk about when there is a risk and when there isn't. Now, one of you just asked a question. I bought this book called How to Reassess Your Chess. Any tips on how to gain most knowledge from it? Well, if you're working for a good chess book, I will recommend that you try to take notes and more importantly, try to be more involved. When you do that, it means like you have to try and guess some of the moves, try to take summary from the positions, make notes and try to explain them. That's something very helpful. In any case, I think it's a very good book. So getting back to the question again, when there is a risk and when there isn't. To evaluate the risk potentially, you have to think of what your opponent can threaten or rather what his, what his advanced pieces are. So what we have out there is a great queen and the rook on a1 coming up. Well, got to tell you, above all else, if he does this, it's going to be a pretty decent risk. <clears throat> so we can't afford to let that happen. Not now at least. Okay. So we don't want to let that happen. What's that? What then? Well, the other important thing that you've got to do is to stabilize. Stabilizing means you prevent any upcoming threats by your opponent, and this will make sure you will not experience any damage. White played the brilliant queen e2. In case black jumps in with his rook on a1, white was prepared to do rook a8, rook a8 and in fact create, ah, this was a mouse slip again, and certainly he didn't want to give away his queen, but he wanted to create a checkmating threat. Check there, check here, and then after the check in F3, there's no saving from black, from the checkmate. So, black played king h7, and now white applied the second thing. You know, it almost feels like a, a position that in which we're defending, we like we're pawned down, and it's not it's not normal. I mean, most just players when they win material expect that they should win the game almost automatically. Like I'm leading the attack, I win a material, then I can continue, I can win another, and that's great. It's one sided thing. He's already lost. So <clears throat> they feel like imagine a battle in a you know like between two fighters. If you hurt, if you wound the uh, other guy, he's going to get weaker. So you keep fighting and you wound him even more and at one point he's just going to collapse. Now that's the logical strain of, of, of thoughts. But the idea is that in chess it's slightly different. Instead of weakening his position when you win material, oftentimes he's going to get some momentum. He's going to get some initiative as we call it. For this reason, it is very important to understand that you will be on the back foot for a while, maybe for a few moves, maybe a little more, but once you get rid of his main attacking possibilities, once you push him back, your long-term advantage is going to matter. It's like you paid a price of initiative for the long material, for the long-term material advantage you're getting. So I mentioned to you that you have to stabilize, like prevent his threats. But what then? That doesn't resolve the problem permanently. So what do we do now? Does anybody have a suggestion? <clears throat> One of you just asked, can I get a discount for the comprehensive beginner course, which is uh, volume 21 to 30? From the pet from the training package that's being offered, I think it's it's the whole the full training package that's being offered from one to one hundred and one. I believe that it's not. I mean, I think there was a there was a, another offer 
like with a big discount for this one, but it was a few weeks ago. I think it will be one other, other opportunity soon, but take a look at the whole one because again, it's like 250 hours for like uh, a, a fantastic 60% discount. And it's, it's something that you could study, you know, years and then get really good at chess. So anyway, Rook D1, that's it. That's called neutralizing. The important thing is you may have resolved the, the little issue, and yet your opponent will still have or keep advanced pieces against your P, against your, your own position. So what you have to do is challenge them. Push the opponent back and make him to, to go down. After rook d1, queen c3, and queen e4, white is in a very good position to drive black's queen and other pieces away. This by itself is beautiful after continuing with the move of queen to the e4 we have the b7 under pressure and black is in trouble queen e4 rook a1 rook takes a1 queen takes a1 and then after that white plays c5 the queen and bishop alone can't do much because especially after we exchanged it's like these are too weak and yet white keeps on going and growing and making it better so now black has no counterplay. It's boring to some people. People who like excitement in chess out of the short, the, you know, the quick, I would say, jumps in the ball, on the board, they wouldn't really appreciate this type of play. They wouldn't really appreciate the kind of gradual technical aspect of strengthening and improving. They wouldn't keep, they wouldn't appreciate the tension building. And yet, if you want to be a good player, you should learn to appreciate it because that's the depth of the game. You know, it's not in the quick bullet games and tactical tricks that you can try in case your opponent blunders. That doesn't lead to anywhere. When you improve as a level or you get to play stronger opponents, they wouldn't blunder. They'll actually play deeper and be more tough. If you want to deal with them, you have to learn and master this type of play. Gradual important improvements, strengthening the position and restricting the opponent. It's slow. It may even sound a little boring, but when you get used to it, you will really love it a lot. Queen c3, and there's queen takes b7. If black captures c5, it doesn't work because then white will just keep advancing his own pawn. You're probably thinking maybe he got some counterplay with the queen and bishop, but truth be told, he can never connect them because now there's b7 <clears throat> and white is going. White is doing great. So um, yeah, well, I mean, queen e1, he tries to activate, but uh, it doesn't seem to work anyhow. Great, there's b6, bishop c4, queen f3, a little check there, queen b1 and b7. Black's queen comes back. White just keeps going. And that was the end of the game. <laughs> Actually, B8 is unstoppable. But that, more importantly, it's the queen that's, that holds it. And I really love this example. One interesting part of this example was just to seeing how white really set it up from the start. And let's talk about the reasons why white won and black lost. The beginning of the game was pretty straightforward. White gained the space and tried to develop his pieces actively. That's the first thing you want to learn. The best way to learn active development is when you exercise on bringing your peers on more advanced and coordinated positions, preferably towards the center. Think about that as the primary goal of any opening. Despite the opening lines and variations you're trying to study, the serious deal is within the center. So why actually gain that opportunity to advance? Small moves like C4 that help us to gain more space and prepare they really count. On a later stage, that space is going to limit the opponent while it will give you great possibilities for each of your pieces. A, value, a very valuable idea later on was when we start. The early middle game is about improvements, not about development, not about attacking. Development we finish, attacking is too early. So how do we improve? Since the pieces may already be in quite advanced positions, we may not have the chance to bring them. I mean, okay, white played bishop e5, so you brought it on a more advanced square, but sometimes we don't have even that. To make things right, you have to coordinate. When the white bishop and the queen got together, they really worked quite nicely in terms of pressing the black king, the knight, and the pawn. 
Starting with a good way of coordinating your pieces and get, making sure you get small things like the open space, a chance to get the pieces even more advanced, and a way to challenge or push the opponent back. All those things separately don't look as important, but when you connect them later on, it became pretty powerful. When the tactics happen, why just was superior in every way? You could say that it was a matter of luck that the black actually hadn't had a ma uh, made a square for his king, and it was just this lucky tactic, but it wasn't. You see, it's it's the whole process of adding all these small improvements in the beginning that later on conclude in a beautiful tactic as similar as this. White did it brilliantly. The other stage of the game that I really want to talk about is how White was able to apply prophylaxis. How many of you constantly ask yourself, what are my weaknesses in the position? I'd say probably less than 5%. Most chess players rarely think about that, and that is a problem. Think of this. What could potentially be a problem in my position? Look around and discover what will the opponent attack against. Not right now, not in the next move, but late, like later. What could become a real significant issue? The king being there is actually a bit of a problem. And so what white played, it, you know, like after the h4, we got this king available. And then after that, the rook came forth. Uh, the, the rook and the queen together, and the chance to fill the play alongside, and then white just got ready. Queen e2, queen h, king h7, and uh, right now, of course, the idea of neutralizing. Neutralizing basically means to push back the opponent's pieces, and then after that, once we get to we got to push him away, it was uh, it was quite nice. So. I have to say, it was uh, really, really interesting on how White uh, got everything ready, and he advanced or challenged Black. It, it took a little while, but it uh, it really, you know, it really worked. Queen c3, queen e4, and then we have uh, c5, queen takes b7. So, okay, well, all that I wanted to tell you so that you can understand is just, um, you know, see the, the, the principle, the concepts, and the way to follow. So, okay. In any case, I would like to bring up one other example, this time from the games of Bobby Fischer himself. Yeah, Fischer also applied a lot of subtle improvement. In his games, he was able to use that to perfectly outplay the opponent. The best way to do it is in one of his games versus Boris Spassky in the f famous match of the century. I'm going to show you that one so you can see what I have in mind and a little bit, a little portion of magic you can bring out. Only one game? No, don't worry about it. I'm going to bring it, bring forward the, the, the Fisher's game versus uh, Spassky. Hang on. Okay, wait for one second. Wait for it. Coming. It's probably one of the most impressive games that Fisher has played, and I quite loved it. The first time when I saw it, it was really, really good. But uh, that's what I wanted to show to show it to, to show it to you. And this was a great game, by the way. Really good. <laughs> okay, almost there. Now, the game that Fisher played versus Spassky started in a rather normal manner, so I'm not going to spend too much time on really bringing every little detail about it. Some of you may already even know the game, so that's okay. I want to show something else about the game. The method that Fisher used to outplay the greatest Soviet chess player back, the, back in the day. So, by the way, if anyone wants me to send him those uh, uh, games and these annotations that I'm just making right now, feel free to message me or email me to my email, like valeri.lilov at gmail.com. I'm going to put my email in the chat, or you can visit my site, which is tigerlilov.com, and send me a message. I'll be more than happy to bring you my suggestions. Oh, and, of course, the games. So, anyway, let's talk about this game. Spassky was black. Fisher started with c4. 
knight f3, d4, and knight of c3. The opening is rather straightforward, so there's nothing special going on about it, really. Just e3, h6, bishop comes back, and then white actually exchanged, takes. It was all more or less theory, where the idea was that white exchanges some pieces he doesn't need and opened the position. Now, what Fischer loved in his games was to basically break the opponent's ego. And one of the ways to do that is when he really advanced in such a way so that his pieces have that superior position to the opponent. Very few chess players really cared that much about the positions of their pieces as opposed to the opponent's very early on. Fischer believed in incredible piece activity that will ultimately deliver victorious position right from the bat, right from the start. What, what he did with queen a4 doesn't seem any dangerous for black. And yet, the queen further came to a3, posing a pretty serious tension against c5. So you could see how important it is to advance the pieces from the early stage and have them on more active places, similar to what Carlsen did in the previous game. So here's a good question. What do we do now? How does white get to strengthen and improve his position from this point? We've tied him down on c5. Things look good. But where do you think white's about to go now? Hmm. Another... The way I'm looking at this position is <clears throat> we have to think about the way to advance. You have to create some threats, but how to how to go on now? Okay. What we really have to do, if you think of it, is take the chance and complete development, not knight e5. That knight e5 is not a development. It's bishop b5 that's development. And that's actually a great way to go. In fact, after continuing with the move of bishop to the b5, we could figure out, uh, you know, in fact, that white's, white's raided the castle. And then after the continuing with the move of short castles, we can do the move of rook to d, uh, uh, rook to c2, maybe even rook to c1. That's an excellent way to follow. Step by step, things are good. And that just follow up. And uh, in fact, after that kind of a variation, <clears throat> then uh, you see after the move of bishop to b5, of course, uh, then black plays with the move a6. And then after a6, you have d to the c, b to the c, short castles, and rook a7. Now that still doesn't look like there is going to be anything. Now the bishop has to retreat, which white did on a backward position, but it was a bishop, so after all, it's a long-range piece. And yet, similarly to the game of Carlsen, Fischer tries to keep going, and in the early middle game, he just strengthens. While it was all about development before, we are now allowed to move two or even three times with a single piece in the opening. So, that leads to a powerful exchange he did on e6. Now we have the bishop pair, so the bishop versus knight, I mean, and this next move is a killer. What would you do with white in this position? We've already gained a bishop versus knight. We've achieved a pretty significant piece command, and black's pawn structure doesn't seem right. What to do now? Hmm. You see, the most valuable thing is that we actually have to find out and create a trouble or a threat. Now, try to think of that. You can't quite create a trouble or a threat if your pieces are just not that good. So what we need is to open 
to exchange. White played the move of pawn to e4 in this case, and that was a great way to make it work. In case of the trade, then what we find out is that uh, White will actually exchange, take and open up the position and do it beautifully. So this is a great way. Just like, Number one as an idea is open. If you have a better development, a strong position, you open the position up. It was this thing that White did. Now, why not just continue the improvement? Because while you keep strengthening your position, you want to watch out for possibilities that will help you to break through and open effectively. It's not always going to happen, but now it looks great. With the move of pawn e4, things are good. Now black can't take it. As in case he takes, there could be bishop c4, even bishop g4. And these two pawns are likely going to fall next. But you see, e4 would never even have been a possibility if white didn't apply this gradual, simple improvement from the very start. Of course, Spassky didn't take the pawn, which led to even more space and restriction created by white. Now, it may sound like it's a little boring as a way to explain it, but... To be told, this approach is fantastic. It doesn't feel like really struggling at any point, but it feels like actually be us being able to construct a lot stronger position while we constantly take away space and possibilities from the opponent. That's exactly what Fisher did here. Now, what do you do when you already have the space and possibilities? You can think of attacks. You can think of opening the position. The late stage of the middle game has already begun and White is enjoying the opportunity to break through as he goes to open and bring more pieces in the play. Queen d8, Queen g3, Rook e7, and a little more restriction that's just perfect. Here, and e6. This whole thing doesn't look like it's going to kill Black, but it limits his possibilities with every small move, like cages him more and more and more and more until at one point he's really ready to lose queen to e8 rook f3 you may wonder why did fisher repeat the moves well where to hurry he's the one to rush remember patience right that's exactly what you want let's be patient bishop d3 queen to e4 and now when everything's being set the perfect break happens Everything is just shows that white's three pieces, the queen, bishop, and the rook, are simply dominating black's other three pieces. So we can realize that with a threat of rook takes h6, black really doesn't have too much to do. Running away with the king seems fine, but now white creates the threat of rook f7. He will be supporting it with the pawn and the bishop, and the queen may even come in. So black has to run again, and he loses. There's a threat of this this, this, and everything. You know, it's just impossible to hold it all together. Spassky resigned. But what I really like about this game, more importantly, is just the way on how White gained the activity. He kept it, and he started the improvement, which further transformed in a weakness. So the phases of the game, which we call development, improvement, and attacking, are really perfect. And you could see that pattern in every Grandmaster game over and over and over again. It's beautiful to see that watching. And then a lot of grandmasters explain how these elements work together, but what they often miss is that you have to be very, you know, ordered when you go in that way, when you go with that improvement. You can't just do it right away. You have to take the time to actually make that sequence work. So I think Fisher did it brilliantly. So check out the link below the video to learn from more than 250 hours of Grandmaster instruction on all these principles and more about attacking, defending, openings, end game, middle game, and so much more. I thank you all for joining me tonight. I hope to talk to you next Saturday at the same time. And in case you have any other questions or whatever, you can always message me or write me an email. I'd be more than happy to give you a personal suggestions for your chess. And uh, I wish you all a great weekend.